You get fired up saying those declarations. Come on. Uh, well, I am uh, super, super excited about this morning uh, because we have somebody that's going to be speaking, Mr. Booth Armstrong. Can we give it up for Booth? Come on. Um, we're, we're kicking off a sermon series today from one of our core values called Free and Responsible. And Booth's going to kick that off today. And, and, and as I thought about our team, uh, if there's somebody that I think really embodies this core value, it's Booth. Um, and so I'm excited that he's going to be sharing. Booth is actually uh, an executive leader uh, on our team. He oversees our, our staff and leads our staff, leads all our staff meetings, uh, really is um, kind of uh, really accountable to our implementing our strategic plan as a church and really plays a high level role at our church. And uh, this is a role that he just took on probably, we kind of, he transitioned from leading our kids ministry into this role. Uh, it's been a little while. We're probably a little bit behind the eight ball on really bringing the church into this. Um, but wanted just to introduce who he is and the role that he plays in our church. And, and just, I'm so thankful for uh, this man and, and Laura and who they mean to our team and the way they lead our team. Uh, just high character people that love God and lead and help lead our church in such a powerful way. And when I thought about free and responsible, I'm like, Booth Armstrong. This guy is free and he's responsible. And, uh, and I really do mean that. And I've just enjoyed the friendship that we've been able to build and just appreciate you, man. Come on, can we give it up for Booth? We love this guy. Come on. Check, check. Awesome. Good morning, y'all. Uh, excited to be with y'all today. We're going to, uh, what time we got? We're going to jam out. A um, lot on my heart this morning. I uh, love this. Really appreciate Jonathan for giving me the opportunity to share. I uh, thought it would be good to start off with just putting on the table what is freedom, what is responsibility. You toss these words out. I think it'd be good to put a little context to that. Uh, one thing that I read that I liked, uh, freedom is the liberty. Uh, the liberty is our freedom from tyranny of having to earn our way to God. So we're free from having to earn our way from God. Freedom from sin, the guilt and condemnation of sin, freedom from the penalty of sin, and eventually freedom from the presence of sin. I thought that was good. I asked Jonathan what his definition of freedom was. It was good. Christ died to set us free from sin, death, fear, and shame in order to establish us in freedom so we can live in love as God's glorious children. I thought that was powerful. And then responsibility. I got Jonathan's take on responsibility. I'm powerful. I'm not powerless. I have responsibility for my thoughts, feelings, actions, and how I respond to situations and circumstances. Okay. Today, what I'd like us to do is, is spend some time identifying the freedom that we have as believers and learning what drives the responsibility we have as believers. Okay. And I want to do, uh, as I was prepping, one thing kind of came to my mind as a really, these things are directly connected in my opinion, freedom and responsibility. And when I was thinking about it, I woke up one morning with just one thought it was the conversation I had with my dad when he gave these to me when I was 16 years old. When I was 16 years old and he gave me this, what did I see? Freedom. What did my dad see? Responsibility. Okay? These two things are connected at the hip. Okay? So, now, thankfully, the Lord has given us Galatians, and it is just full of good stuff, okay? So I could probably go for weeks on this. I'm going to try to do it in one, in one go. Y'all bear with me. We're going to start in Galatians 2, verse 11. And um, if you have your Bible, read along with me. If you don't, bring a Bible. All right, here we go. Starting off, um, uh, the, I think the verse, I think the uh, word does a good job of setting the table. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him. This is Paul, by the way. I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid 
of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas was Paul's best friend and helped run the church there. So everybody's ser- separating themselves from this group of believers. Okay. And this is Paul. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So what Paul is telling Peter is, is, hey, whoa, time out, man. You're a Jew and you don't follow these customs because you're justified by Jesus Christ. But now you're acting like these people need to be justified by works. Okay? Because the first work of a salvation plan for a Gentile in Antioch would be circumcision. Okay? So, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So what Paul is saying here is, is he's saying, hey, Peter, and he's doing this in front of everybody. We're not gonna do this. We're not going to create an environment where people have to earn their way to Christ. We're not going to create an environment where people have to work to be justified. We're not going to create an environment where people have to strive to gain his acceptance. We are going to create an environment where if someone believes in Jesus, they're justified. Period. They're free from all of that work. Okay. Um, If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that ourselves are sinners, does that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. So Paul's a pretty smart guy here. He says, I know what people are going to think in this room. They're going to think I'm giving people license to sin. They're going to think that God doesn't mind if we sin. And he says, that's not true. It's, it's an interesting equation. We are justified by Christ. We still sin. We're still justified by Christ. Okay? If I rebuild what I destroy, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. He's talking to Paul. Or excuse me, he's talking to Peter. Because Peter is rebuilding the law for the Gentiles and it's putting him in what? He's mistreating another believer. Where I come from, you can kind of chalk that up to sin. He's mistreating the Gentiles because he's trying to rebuild the law so the Gentiles have to work to get their salvation. Okay? For through the law I died to the law... For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for Christ. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I live in the body. I live in faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. This is, Paul doesn't, Paul's a a very strong writer. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So what Paul is saying is, is Paul is telling this church, y'all want to know when I died to the law? When Christ died on the, the cross. And if you try to do this thing where you work your way to salvation in God's love, but Jesus also worked, that can't play. 
because Christ died for nothing then. Either Christ is total atonement for our sins or he's not. Either Christ suffered and took the wrath of the world to give us complete and total freedom or he didn't. And Paul is saying he did. And therefore, there is nothing you can do to try to earn his love and earn your salvation. And if you do, you're almost insulting what he did because you're looking at Christ on the cross and you're saying, I know what you did, but it's just not quite good enough. You need my help for me to get to a place where I'm in justified standing with you. Make sense? All right, so this has happened in front of God and everybody. All right, there we go. All right, we're going to transition into chapter three because I just cannot get past sharing the first five verses in chapter three. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was uh, clearly portrayed crucified. So Paul is saying, I walked you through what God did for you. You know that your salvation is not earned. It is a gift. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning your spirit, excuse me, are you so foolish after beginning with the spirit, are you now living to attain your goal by human efforts? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, excuse me, if it was really for nothing, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you've heard? So he asked the Galatians, hey, real quick, how did you come to know him and get accepted? Did you work at it or did he just give it to you? And if that was your foundation, why are you now trying to work at it? All these miracles that you're seeing, did he do them because you were abiding or did he do them because you earned them? It's abiding. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to jump now to chapter five. Oh, excuse me. We're going to take a pit stop in chapter three because there's one other thing I want to show, a couple more things I want to show about our freedom. Uh, verse, we're in chapter 3, verse 23. We're going to go through verse 29. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. Okay? So before faith came, that would be Jesus. Believers were locked up by the law. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we no longer under the supervision of the law. That's good. Faith comes, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. Okay? This is where it gets even better. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So if you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you become a son of God. For all you have, excuse me, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you belong to Christ. Then you are all Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. All right, so what's happening here is, is Paul is saying, not only are you not under the law anymore, you are out from under the law because Jesus has come and Jesus paid the price for our salvation, for our connection with the Father. He goes a step further and says, not only are you forgiven, but you're a son. 
I was teaching in the um, Oakland's class last week, and this just rocked me. I mean, I probably should have known this, but it just rocked me. We were teaching on 1 John 3, 1 last week. Okay? 1 John 3, 1 is the love that the Father has for you that he made you sons and daughters. And when I was reading about that scripture, one thing was just really, really cool for me. Do you know that's completely unnecessary when it comes to the salvation plan? That God absolutely could have put a salvation plan in place where Jesus died on the cross, he pays for our sin, we're free from sin and death, and it stops right there. But he didn't. He said, not only am I going to make you free from sin and death, I'm going to call you a son or a daughter. You not see the deep love he has for us in that? He's going the extra mile, okay? All right. I blew me away last week. I don't know if it hit the kids as hard as it hit me, but when it hit me, I was like, are y'all seeing this? All right, here we go. Um, Five, chapter five. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't go back to the law. AKA, legalism is not the answer in Christianity. Stay free. You can't earn your salvation. You can't earn his love. You can't earn that connection. That is a gift given. Okay? Paul, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he, uh, he is obligated to obey the whole law. There is no halfway here. If you go down that path, you have to obey the whole law. And I can tell you what happens if you obey the whole law. You lose, because it's impossible. It's the whole reason why Jesus did what he did. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. Are y'all hearing this? Legalism, earning your salvation, alienates you, estranges you from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. When I was growing up as a Christian, every time somebody told me somebody was falling away from grace, you know what that meant? Every time that story was being talked about, you know what that meant? They had like done some real bad sin. Bible here says if you go into legalism, you've fallen away from grace. You know what the crazy thing is? Is real bad sin that's repented doesn't make you fall away from grace. So the definition of falling away from grace that I was raised in in the American church was you've fallen from grace if you sin. That's not true. You can sin and still be in grace if you repent. And own it. But if you go legalism and you're striving to earn it, now you've fallen away from grace. All right. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. To, oh, let's, let's just do a couple things here. I think we're at a good checkpoint to talk about what our freedom is. I think Paul's made two things really clear. Legalism's a booby word. It's a no-no. We don't want to do legalism, okay? Uh, let's, I read this. I thought it was good. Legalism is no little thing. It takes away our liberty and puts us into bondage. It makes Jesus and his work to no profit for us. It puts us under obligation to the whole law. It violates the work of the Spirit of God. It makes us focus on irrelevant things. It keeps us from running the race Jesus set before us. It isn't from Jesus, and a little bit of it can infect the entire church. 
I think the bigger thing that Paul was trying to point out is, is my connection to God the Father and God the Son, their love for me, my justification and righteousness, my sonship, have nothing to do with my ability, effort, striving, what I have done, what I'm doing, or what I promise to do. Those are all established on his accord, not on mine. Is that good? That's freedom. Amen. All right. We were just giving car keys. We got lots of freedom. Okay. So what do we do with it? Galatians 5.13. So we, we stopped in Galatians on verse 4. There's some, the whole, it's six chapters. The whole thing is good, but to stay on pace. 5.13. My brothers, you were called to be free. We've established that. Jesus has called us to a life of freedom. But do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will, destroy, you will be destroyed by each other. So what Paul is saying here is, is hey, you've been given all this freedom. Now the responsibility is, is don't use it for license. Use it to love and serve one another. Now we're starting to scratch at what? Responsibility. Okay? I read this. I thought it was good. We have been made free by Christ Jesus. Now we are called to stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free. We have been set free. Now the question is, how will we use our freedom? Okay? All right. Um, we're going to keep rolling because this is where I think it gets really good. Verse 16. So I say to you, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. For sinful nature and the spirit, for the sinful nature, desi the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. So the spirit and the flesh cannot what? Coexist. Living in the spirit is the antidote to living in the flesh, okay? So now God's saying, hey, I gave you all this freedom. You got the car keys. You wanna drive it? Can I make two recommendations? Love people with that freedom and be led by the Spirit with that freedom, okay? Because those are the things that will keep you living in this freedom healthy, okay? Now, I wanna go back real quick to Verse um, 13, it says, you've been called to freedom, only do not use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. I want you to hear something that's big on Boo's heart. I'm not here today to talk to you about a responsibility that's a burden. I'm here to talk to you about today about a responsibility that's an opportunity. There's two ways you could look at this. God's requiring me to love others and live by the Spirit, and that's a burden. Or I got an opportunity. Okay? And this is a huge part of my heart. I so... So much has been done for us. So much has been done for the body of Christ. 
we cannot explain the gift we were given. If you give us an opportunity to then glorify that, I think we should try to run for it. I believe, I use this cheesy analogy, I believe being a Christian and not using your freedom to love and serve others and to live a life led by the Spirit is like being a bird that doesn't fly. You're just sitting on the ground and you weren't made to do that. And the way Booth internalizes this because of the people I was raised around spiritually is if I can fly, let's go high and fast. <laughs> now there's boundaries to that. We've, we've touched those boundaries in our marriage. I get the white flag like, hey, you need to, you're flying too high and too fast. And that's fair. And you can go too far. And you can be doing it because you want to make money. You can be doing it because you want status. You could be doing it for a lot of reasons that aren't, I'm feeling spirit-led and love, I want to love others. But I think we all need to be mature enough to live this life where we can push it. The one thing that I work through in my heart is, is I see people pursue things with excellence. They get up early. They're uncomfortable. They push themselves through things. And I admire that. And we celebrate that as a culture. Check Saturdays, 2.30, CBS. We celebrate that. That's, that's the marquee SEC matchup every Saturday for those who are keeping score at home. So my question is, is am I approaching my ability to love and serve others, and am I approaching my opportunity to be led by the Spirit with the same excellence and diligence and intentionality that an athlete does their craft? Because that's where I want to find myself. And if I hit the limit a couple times because I'm flying too fast and too high, I'm okay with that. I'll back off. I can adjust. But I want to fly. Because a lot's been done for me. So I'm going to go for it. And I'm also not going to be perfect in that process. Matter of fact, some portions of it are going to be a dumpster fire. <laughs> but you know what? I'm free. And I can tell him, hey, sorry that went that way. I love you. I'm going to adjust and change. And you know what he's like? Son. I'm with you. My dad and my, my natural father has got a spiritual gift on his life in one way that has blessed me so much in my Christian walk. It did not matter how I behaved in life. I knew when I walked back into the corner, if you know, think about boxing analogy, you go to the corner after you've just been tattered up, right? I knew when I sat down in the corner, there was going to be one guy in that corner ready to love on me and encourage me and pick me up. That's your natural father. Excuse me, that's your heavenly father. He, you can't strive, you can't earn his love, he, he does love you. All right. I wanted to address the opportunity burden thing. Don't address this as a burden. This is not a burden. This is an opportunity, okay? If I told you that if you could come up with $25,000 by lunch, there was a young businessman in Birmingham who needed to raise $250,000. He needed $250,000. He was $25,000 short. If you can get him that $25,000, you're an initial investor, and in seven years, eight years, he's going to take that business, $250,000, and he's going to sell it for over a billion dollars. That's a true story happened in Birmingham. How hard do you work to get that $25,000? 
You know what that's called? Opportunity. See what I'm saying? And that's for money. That's not for glorifying God. I want the body to step into a little bit of, I'll work for glorifying God like I would work for that. And I'm not saying I do it perfect, but that's the way we ought to be. Because a billion dollars compared to my king? Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. There's not an amount of money you could put on it. All right. Here we go. Verse, where were we, y'all? For the sinful nature's desires is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. We're about to go into the sinful nature. Sexual immor uh, immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, uh, dissension, fractions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's heavy. We're going to get back to that in a second. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such thing, there is no law. Okay? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified to their sin, sinful nature, with its passions and desires. Real cool thing here. Y'all, can we all just, when God writes, he is so cool. Okay? He just does little things that just blow me away. When he talks about, when he talks about the sinful nature and all the list of it, what are those? In the NIV, it's the works of the flesh. But when he talks about the fruit, excuse me, the, the good stuff from the spirit, what is it? Isn't that a little cool? The works versus the fruit. All right, how do you get fruit? How does fruit grow? said it earlier, abiding. Okay? All right. All right. Responsibility. Those who are saved by God's grace have a opportunity to fulfill, not to earn salvation, but in gratitude of salvation. What is driving our responsibility? To love and serve others and to be led by the Spirit. Danny Silk always says this, which I love. I think it's applicable here. God is my source and people are my target. All right. Uh, everything that we've, well, most everything we've covered so far has been straight scripture. I'm going to give you a little bit of my heart right here, okay? So you got to hold this open handed. Can y'all do that for me? All right, a um, couple things on this that I think are good. I've used this analogy in front of a lot of y'all before. Laura, Laura consulted me and said, you overplay this analogy, but it's just one of my favorites. There's a university called Washington and Lee, okay? It's a great university, and they had a president take over the university, and Quickly after he took over the university, this new president was given the rule book, and the rule book was bigger than the Bible. Okay? And they said, hey, one of the things we need to do on your onboarding is we need to learn that rule book. And he was like, not happening. They were like, yeah, that's got to happen because you can't leave the university if you don't know Washington and Lee's rules. So he said, I'll tell you what. I'll read the book. I'll read your rules. But as the president, I want the opportunity to make a revision to it if I see revisions. They were like, you go for it. So he reads the entire book, comes back. They have their meeting. He shows up with one piece of paper. On his one piece of paper, this was an all-boys school at the time. On his one piece of paper, 
he had a new rule book. You know what his new rule book was? Carry yourself as a Christian gentleman. Because if you do that, you're going to meet all those. The other thing that I pick up on my heart a little bit when I'm going into this is, is the law can be a distraction. Okay, think about our car analogy. Every law that's about me driving this car is things that I what? Shouldn't do or should do? Come on now, I shouldn't. You know what they don't make laws for? Things that I should do. That's the problem with the law. Okay, now you're going to get a little bit of booth on this. Every sports team, if they're going to excel, they have to have, in general, they have to have two things. Two things really good. What are the two things every sports team needs? Don't overthink it. Offense. Defense. You know what our freedom is? <laughs> fair, fair point. In most sports, you got to have a really good offense and defense. You know what our freedom is? In booths, it's the best defense you'll ever get in your life. Y'all were singing a song earlier today. So much better because he's the great what? I'm free of all that. You're not scoring on me. You know what our responsibility is? It's your chance to go on the offense. It's your chance to get the ball and start driving. It's your opportunity to go put points on the board. You got the best defense you could ever imagine. What are you going to do with it? I want to take the ball. I want to drive it down the field. All right. One thing that I want to show y'all real, real quick in this. Again, scripture, y'all. So good. Can I show y'all somebody who's operating out a lot of out of a lot of freedom and responsibility in a way that we might not perceive as Christians two chapters back when Paul addresses Peter there it is cuz Paul sees someone being Paul is moved out of what love for who? The Gentiles who were sitting in the back by themselves while all the Jews, Peter and all of his boys sit over here. And Paul doesn't do the, hey, Peter, let me pull you aside and let's do this one-on-one -on -one together. I know that Jesus said, if I have an issue with you, that we're going to meet just me and you and I'm going to tell you about what I feel. Paul says in front of everybody, we're not going to do this. I want you to think about this. Peter at this time is probably the most powerful Christian in the world. He's the guest of honor in Antioch. And Paul is point blank calling out his sin in front of God and everybody. Now, little disclaimer, I think if that sin would have occurred between Paul and Peter, Paul would have pulled him aside. But that sin didn't occur between Paul and Peter. That sin occurred in front of everybody, and it touched a red-hot nerve, which is the gospel. And Paul's not playing with the gospel. So he addresses Peter in front of everybody and says, Hey, man, I love you. I'm super responsible. I love them. And we're not going to do this. And in that moment, I would offer 
that Paul was operating out of love and being led by the Spirit. You know who else was? Peter. Because Peter could have said, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, you can't do this in front of, to me in front of everybody. That's wrong. That's not what Peter did. Peter said, from what we know in scriptures, Peter said, hey, valid. That's on me. Sorry, I'll adjust. Because he's operating out of what? High responsibility. Okay? So right there in the scripture while Paul's talking about this, I think we get a beautiful example of what freedom and responsibility looks like. And it looks in a way that I don't think most Christians would, would catch. Because there's what? Conflict. And we as a body believe conflict is not loving. And that's a lie. Conflict that's personal, conflict that's degrading, conflict that is that, that there is no place for that. Conflict and being led by the Spirit, which the Bible is rid, I don't know if that's the right word, the Bible is full of examples of conflict, which was directed by the Spirit. Okay, so um, I think it is super important for us to be led by the Spirit when we go on the offense and we're managing our responsibility. I'll tell you a couple things about the Spirit um, that I kind of gathered in my prep. And then we're going to wrap up here in just a second. To walk in the Spirit first means that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Second, it means that we're open and sensitive to His influence. Third, it means we pattern our life after the influence of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So when we're walking in the Spirit... He's living in us, we're sensitive to him, sensitive to him, and we're patterning our life to where it can influence us. What does patterning our life to where it can influence us look like? Secret place, worship, reading your Bible, praying. Okay? That's patterning your life to where the Spirit can have an influence on you. This was, I thought this was good. Life by the Spirit is neither legalism nor license, nor a middle way between them. It's a life of faith and love that is above all these false ways. Cool. All right. Um, Cole, if you want to come up, and if the prayer servants want to come up, I want to, uh, I want to wrap up on two fronts. Appreciate y'all for giving me the opportunity to share this morning. Two fronts. Uh, one, we, we hit a tough verse in that process. And that tough verse is, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, envy, murder, drunkenness. That's not a complete list. It's just a list that was on Paul's, tip of Paul's pen, or mind. He says, of which I tell you, just as I also told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What that verse is telling you is if you live in those things, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? The idea isn't that Christians should never commit sin, but the idea is, is that Christians can never stay in that sin. Christians fall. Think about David. Think about 
Peter denied Christ. Jonah went in the opposite direction of what the Spirit was leading him to. But all of these people acted with responsibility when their sin was brought to them and they were confronted with their sin. They repented, they owned it, and they adjusted. You don't fall from grace when you sin. The grace is there for that exact purpose. You just have to own yourself in the process to access that grace. Okay? So I'll do two things this today with our prayer servants. One, if you've got something going on in your life that you want to repent of and you want to be a powerful person and you want to live in that responsibility, you can do it in your chair. You can come up here and do it with somebody if that would be more comfortable for you. But I think when they were doing worship and they were talking about the white flag, I think it's connected to this. I think if somebody wants to break something off their life and to step into new responsibilities and they want that grace in their life, I think you can get it this morning. The other thing I want to do is, is when I think of freedom and responsibility and I think of who is the person who lived with the most freedom and the most responsibility of anybody I've ever heard of, the easy answer is who? Man. Think about the freedom and look at the responsibility. It's so good. Freedom. He didn't have to go to the cross. He didn't have to. He was accepted. He was loved. You know what the cross was for Jesus? It was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to glorify the Father and say, this is my shot. I'm going to give it. And he loved others. And he was led by the Spirit. And it's a beautiful example of living with freedom and responsibility.